Good morning, church, and happy Easter. He has risen. He has risen indeed. I have to be honest, this part is what I miss most about us gathering together on Easter morning. I love that kind of call and response of He has risen, and He has risen indeed. I love us proclaiming that. I, if you want to make your pastor happy, uh, give me a call. Give me a call this morning and say that very thing, he is risen, so that I can respond, he is risen indeed. Or however we want to do it, it, it there's something just magical, uh, miraculous about hearing those words. And, and I think it's because it's God's people uh, proclaiming well something really deep. It's, we're not just proclaiming that Jesus isn't dead anymore, though that's part of it, but we don't celebrate Lazarus. We don't celebrate others. And it, well, you know, now that I say that, I wonder if somewhere in the world there is a Lazarus celebration. Uh, man, if only there was a device where I could search out all the world's knowledge at my fingertips. But until that's invented, uh, the real point of claiming that he has risen, he has risen indeed, is to say more than just the fact that he is not dead. It is to say that there is something profoundly different about the world. It is about celebrating a victory over death. That death is no longer, sin is no longer what binds us, and it is in fact victory through Jesus Christ. I hope you had a chance to, prior to seeing this, to listen to the reading that was just wonderfully done uh, for our passage this morning there in Matthew 27 and uh, skipping a little bit to go to 28. There, That first part is of a moment that, well, is really momentous. I mean, think about the fact that when Jesus died, it's, it's as if God's omnipotence, his total power, wasn't the completion of his work. That there was something else that he longed to do, that he came not as all-powerful anymore, but in the flesh and died at the hands of people, and died in death. I mean, I, okay, that's kind of silly. How else do you die? But to realize that the almighty God of the universe experienced that and suffered, and it changed everything. Remember in the reading where it has these strange things, it has a lot of strange stuff that harkens back to the Old Testament and a lot of language there that may be difficult to understand any more than Somebody who quotes Princess Bride, how little sense that might make if you've never watched the movie. But there's a lot going on there, and there was something really powerful. You remember where they were talking about the tearing of the veil? And what is described there is in the temple in Jerusalem, where there is this central part, there's like almost concentric circles. I mean, they're not really circles, but these walls that into this place that they call the Holy of Holies. It is said to have literally contained part of the presence of God, that God could be met there. As a matter of fact, only one day a year on behalf of the entire nation, the high priest on the Day of Atonement would go and be able in the cloud of uh, incense to be able to be there and represent the people. It was considered the approaching the presence of God that was so holy, so powerful, we could only do so with hundreds of laws of ritual purification to not do it wrong was so vital and so important. And that kind of otherworldliness of God is absolutely important, especially to a pagan world who can see their gods by physical representations and idols and those kind of things to say, no, when we refer to the God, it's something so foreign, so different, so holy and separate from us. Yet at Jesus' death, something had changed. You see, there was this big veil between the Holy of Holies and the rest. And in this veil, it is ripped from top to bottom as if God, by his very hands, ripped that cloth to say that the presence that God of God, who otherwise was limited to this one day and to this one place in the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, that instead it was now open and radicalized and equalized that we all have access to have a relationship, a direct personal relationship with God. 
If you received that letter from us this past week, there was a piece of cloth there. I encourage you to bring this out because what I would love for us to do together, as much as together might happen, obviously I've done this before, but you'll get to do it. But listen to the sound of this ripping cloth and have it really symbolize that opening of the way, the opening of the veils that, the, that Easter has given us, that Good Friday and Easter weekend that of death of Jesus and opening up the presence of God. So if you will just take this with me, uh, hopefully you have have a little cut or you could obviously use another piece of cloth I represent cutting a little bit to make it rip a little bit. And let's do this together. One, two, three. What a beautiful sound. It's the sound of, it symbolizes the opening of the presence of God to you and to me that we can have a direct one-on-one -on -one relationship. It is a sound unlike no other. It is the sound of victory over sin and death. I want to share a comic with you because, you know, the Easter story that we read, uh, certainly about the tearing of the veil, and then we read a little bit more about when the angel described to Mary and the other Mary about that he was no longer in the tomb and to go anticipate meeting him, to go out. And that, I want to capture that moment, that moment that says God is alive, that there is power and victory available to you and I in the spiritual life. And as we anticipate, like Mary did, not really knowing all the answers, but knowing something is really, really different. Let me share this comic with you. Uh, it's a Calvin and Hobbes comic. Live for the moment is my motto. You never know how long you've got. You could step in the road tomorrow and wham, you get hit by a cement truck then you'd be sorry you put off your pleasures. That's why I say live for the moment. What's your motto? Look down the road. It's about looking down the road that I really want to talk about. As I mentioned, this is a different kind of story than you normally hear about Easter, as opposed to listening to when Jesus was seen and they recognized and responded to him and all those things, which certainly is an important part of the Easter story, but so is this. The first moment that Mary and the other Mary are aware that Jesus has indeed risen from the dead. And they're that special moment where they can anticipate that there is more to come and that they have something to do about that, that they, they have a road to go down. And we are very similar in that situation. We have a lot of choices in life. And we can choose to be down, to look down the road a little bit, to see where that leads, to see Jesus and want to be with him. Not only, because the metaphor does break down a little bit, not only is he the destination, but he is the presence along with us. But that road, the road that leads in the direction that God wants, or are we just not worried about that at all? Just live for the moment get what we can out of it. And that doesn't necessarily mean these childish pleasures. Maybe we feel like we're sophisticated in our pleasures and we care about others and what makes us feel good in that sense and contributing and those kind of things. But I think the story of Easter is in part that looking down the road matters. A couple of areas where I think Easter proves this is one is that it suggests that looking down the road matters for eternity talking about heaven. I don't normally preach about heaven, at least as much as I probably should. There's a couple reasons for that. One is other people. I think there's a lot of confusion in our culture about the talk of heaven. And there's a seg segment of our population, for example, who believe that heaven exists, but doesn't believe in hell and would be deeply offended by the idea that there are multiple destinations that, you know, at least two destinations and uh, that that would bother them uh, immensely. Uh, to suggest that their loved one didn't do anything else but automatically die and go to heaven. And because they just see it as an inevitability. And so talking around that idea that it isn't a guarantee. It isn't a guarantee. Well, it could be guaranteed. We'll get to that. 
That's hard. Another misconception or another thing that makes it difficult as people talk about it is they really see the idea of heaven and, and pastors talking about heaven as pretty manipulative. Uh, that they are convinced heaven doesn't exist and for pastors to talk about some reward that exists in the future that they will never be held accountable for and never have to deliver on themselves, that that's enough of an issue that uh, we can be used to manipulate people, that somehow the pastor is controlling his congregation. Let me know if that ever happens. Uh, but I think really the main reason I don't talk about it a lot may have to do with a lot of the misconceptions I had growing up. You see, I saw heaven as, as the reward for good people. You know, if good people do enough good stuff and they qualify that they can go to heaven and, and what you don't want to do is not meet the mark and end up having to go to hell as the punishment for the bad people. And that, you know, I, it, what had, I had to do was figure out what do I need to do to make sure I'm good enough and what do I have to do to, you know, do I go to the right church and do I pray the right prayers and do I say the right things and how can I make sure I get there? Because that's the reward I want to hold on to, or at least avoid the punishment. And so maybe the reward, I, to be honest, I don't know that I was that intrigued by heaven itself. I, I wasn't in necessarily interested by, oh, I get to hang out with Jesus, because that kind of sounded boring. I just really didn't want the other. But I tell you that um, I think the scriptural idea is that heaven is a reward only in the sense that a road trip's destination might be the reward. You know, we travel down to California a few times a year usually. Matter of fact, we were going to before we had to stay in the house and give up a vacation. And we certainly want to get to that destination. We want to get where we're going. We want to see family. We are looking forward to the joy that, that relationships, uh, those relationships bring. But the journey is part of it as well. Sometimes it can be a really tough part, one that we don't like very much and that we feel like we simply have to accomplish to get to the end, but other parts we can really enjoy and we can enjoy one another and, and the stuff along the way. And I think that's probably a better image for the idea of heaven, that it isn't about a reward, a, a payment, an earned wage for doing all the right stuff and checking the right boxes as much as it is simply looking down the road and making the conscious choice, I want to be where Jesus is. Because the existence of heaven and knowing about that changes perspective of so much. It changes everything, really. In the same way, not believing in heaven, not believing that there's any accountability or judgment or justice after this life, that, that, that would change things as well. I submit to you, it is only with the promise of heaven and the existence of God that life has any meaning. Now, I know some are going to suggest, well, 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 wait, I don't believe in God and my life has plenty of meaning. There's plenty that matters. And the truth is, is I would agree with you that your life does matter because it's not belief in heaven that makes life matter. It's the existence of heaven. So your life does. But let's let's go with that and say, say oh, there is nothing. That earth is all there is. There is nothing after this. If we were to be on this little thought experiment, then I submit to you that life doesn't have any intrinsic meaning. Let's think of it, realize that, you know, in a billion years, this earth is supposed to be uninhabitable relatively destroyed, that the radiation from the sun will increase so much that uh, life will no longer be livable on this planet and we'll all be gone. I don't know, maybe we're lucky enough by then to have gone beyond this planet and gone beyond the solar system. But eventually, uh, some of the prevailing theories is that the universe will either will grow cold and distant, will be Nothing but we'll have no more energy for creation of stars. It'll be just riddled with black holes or maybe heat death and that all the energy will be so evenly dispersed throughout the universe that there's no gradients anymore. And the universe will just cease to have life and, and we will no longer exist. We will no longer have a humanity. Anything that we have accomplished, anything that we've done will not 
matter anymore, whether it's the works of Shakespeare or great construction or the compassion and uh, love that we have shown for a child, uh, none of it will matter because it's all going to end. It's very similar to the idea that if you were in a, a burning building that you could not escape, you were, for the moment you're safe, for the moment you're okay, but inevitably it's going to get to you too and you will be wiped out. The, the, the stuff you accomplish in that room, the the, the things that you build, the great American novel that you just wrote that will never survive this thing, and it's all gone. Did it matter? Does it really matter? No one will ever know. Nothing will have ever happened. All this stuff is gone. But if there is heaven, if there is a life after that fire, if something, if maybe not you know, maybe the, the pieces that you built, the things that you've learned, the ways that you've lived, that that matters, that you will move on to eternity, then it does. Then those things, even in the burning building, even on the sinking ship, even uh, in a deserted isle that's going to be destroyed by a hurricane, whatever scenario we want to come up with, it does matter because we will continue to exist. You will continue to exist. I will continue to exist. And it will matter for eternity. Of course, the fact that we want to matter doesn't mean things actually do matter. But I submit to you that our desire, our desire to search for meaning when otherwise it's not self-evident, or when we find meaning that it is part of the fact that we are born with this drive to understand something, to be a part of something much bigger. And I tell you, there are some who say just evolutionary chance or a hang on that, and it is one of those weird things that we, unlike when we get hungry, there is indeed food to meet that desire. Uh, simply because we want food doesn't mean food's going to be available, but the desire represents something innate in us that is drawing us towards something real. I guess if you're going to suggest that we have a desire for meaning, but there really is no meaning. I think you'd have a hard case to prove when in fact, intuitively, I think we get it. Plato, thousands of years before Jesus had argued of the self-evident nature that there would be an afterlife, comes from a deep knowledge, a deep longing. And Easter says and makes the case that things are going to matter here because eternity matters. There's another part. I'll go a little more quickly over this, but I also want to suggest that as we look down the road, maybe not all the way to the end destination, maybe it's worth just looking at a year from now. You know, we talk, uh, we've got this annual calendar. Easter happens each year. Easter is a time we often stop and reflect and think about what's to come or certainly what has been. And I want you to reflect on that. If you think back a year ago uh, to last Easter, uh, where were you spiritually? What were you doing? And, and over this past year, have you moved farther down that road, closer to Jesus? Have you worked on your life and your spiritual life? Where of your spiritual journey, you know, moving down that road matters. It, it certainly is really about what way you're facing. You know, we know the story of the thieves on the cross who also died when Jesus was crucified. And the one thief who didn't really care about Jesus, had an opportunity to mock him. And, and another one who knew very little of Jesus, but what little he knew, he was willing to, to rise and, and, and focus on him and try to be a part of what Jesus was doing, defending him in this case. And that touching moment when he says to Jesus, Lord, when you come into your own, remember me. And Jesus says to him, I tell you the truth today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, that thief didn't all of a sudden become a good guy. I mean, I suppose he could have, and had he lived longer, would he have done some things differently? We certainly hope so, but really what happened is he just changed his trajectory, changed to where he was going, was looking for the first time, maybe, down the road. It wasn't about his goodness as much as his focus, and as attention matter of fact, Scripture indicates that when it tells us that we will be saved if we repent and believe or believe and repent. And 
repent literally means to, to turn, to stop from going one direction and start going another, to go down the road, to look down the road and go that direction. But the truth is, as we have lived for the past year, and, and my prayer is that many of us will be living at least another year, and between here and there, are we actually moving down the road? Was it just an intellectual ascent, or did we actually change our perspective and say we want to be spiritually more than we've been before, to be closer to God than we've been before, to allow Him to transform us in greater amounts? And, and I think it's just worth asking the question. Maybe you're not a Christian at all. Maybe you've never made a decision for Jesus and, and, and you have made a commitment and say, hey, I'm willing to be open-minded. What have you done in this past year? Or more importantly, what are you going to do in this next year to make true on that promise? Are you going to talk with someone who you respect that uh, you could ask questions of? Are you going to read scripture and see, I'm going to try to figure out who this Jesus guy is and see what he had to say. If you are serious about being open-minded, what are you going to do by Easter next year to actually pursue and seek God if he is to be found? For those of us who claim the name of Jesus, how are we doing with some of the basic things of connecting to God, like worship? How's your church attendance been the past few weeks? Okay, I'm kidding. Obviously not that great, but the uh, really when it comes to the other spiritual disciplines of maybe prayer and fasting, of, of reading scripture, of meditating, of really trying to connect with Jesus and, and to hear what he has to say and to obey that. Have you taken some steps? We've had a different kind of life, many of us, because of this COVID thing. And uh, has your life been marked by a pursuit of God? How about your relationships with other folks in the church? You know, we have the kind of space that it would be really helpful. There are those who don't hear many human voices and would love to have somebody call them and connect. Are there ways that you can reach out to send a card, a text, a call to someone you care about or you're concerned about? Reach out to them. And maybe that will be something that could carry on through the next year. How about simply serving, finding ways to make a difference in people's lives? Are you willing to take what you're good at and use for Christ and His church? Maybe you haven't done very well this past year. What about this next year? Are you willing to look down the road and say, Lord, I want to commit to you to do that? Now you might ask, well, how do I do that right now? And the truth is, I don't know. I don't know. I have to be honest, I've been really thinking and praying about that myself. Uh, uh, talking to a camera as opposed to really interacting with you is rough. I miss our church. I miss our connection. I don't know that the things I am really good at, I'm able to practice. But I want to experiment. And, and if part of that is I would love to help you. If you are saying, I'm ready to take the next spiritual step, but I just need some help and guidance, call me. Call me. I would love to do it. You'll notice there uh, uh, the website is linked in the video. Some of you may even be able to watch this on the website and our contact information. Let's talk. I would love to help you take the next spiritual step, whatever it is, because we need to go down that road. We need to walk arm in arm with Jesus into a destination of eternity because it is certainly there's no better place than the road that leads to heaven. And there is no better place than to be with Jesus. And just the sound of doing that together is the sound of victory. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, God, I just ask that you inspire us and move us to look down that road, to realize that Easter opened up an entire new world of opportunity for us to connect with you and your very presence. So Lord, that, that we would either practice that if we've had it before or seek it if we have yet to have it. And for those of us who have made that decision before, uh, Lord, that we would be active in just looking down the road and taking the steps in that right direction. You know, I think about the thief. If he could have gotten off that cross and lived his life, would it have been different? Well, we're not currently on a cross. Is our life any different? I confess, Lord, it's not as great as I would like it to be. Forgive me my sins. Help me become a better follower of you. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'll be praying for you, church. Pray for me.